For those of you who tend to nod off, I'm going to tell you what I'm about to say, then I'm going to say it and tell you what I said. I have bad news and good news. The bad news is journalism is going to impact more and more of your lives on a daily basis, on an almost never stop basis, 24-7, you'll be consuming more and more information delivered by fewer and fewer experts. The good news is that more and more of those journalists are being trained here at the Dow Center by John Miller and the other faculty at Hillsdale, so that's the good news. I had a, uh, had a number of them come through the studio today. We pre-recorded the program, and it's remarkable the energy and the capacity that you're mainlining into journalism. So everything I'm talking tonight about, why did we dominate talk radio, uh, can be said to be applicable even in advance of it occurring because there are new media being invented uh, as we speak, new platforms, new distribution methods, and the good news is, and I'll dwell on this a little bit at length, is that Hillsdale is in the forefront of training people to use those techniques. And I can't overestimate how important that is over the long haul. I had three journalism students in there today, all of whom want to go to Washington, D.C., which is terrific, and all of whom are going to have 50 years of professional capacity or more, and that's 150 years of professional capacity sitting in front of me, and I began to estimate the number of tweets they would send over the course of their 150 years. And so Hillsdale is influencing every single one of those tweets, which in turn influences the information arc in the direction of the country in profound ways. So I'm very glad, grateful to be here. I'm even grateful to see Larry again. <laughs> Largely because Penny came with him. But it's great to be back here. Arne is a very dangerous man to have as a friend. Uh, of course, I was talking about him on the air today, and I made I referred to him as Prince Oberon of the radio. Now, given that this was a reference to popular culture, he had no idea what I was referring to. It is a character from the Game of Thrones series, also known as the Red Viper, uh, a very dangerous and quick-witted uh, fellow. So uh, I welcome Larry on, and it went right over his head, so I had to explain it to him later. And I'm happy to be back here. I was here about five years ago, but I get mixed signals. I'm only invited in January. And so it's a kind of a passive-aggressive approach. And I think it's because so many of the faculty here have been guests on the radio show over the years. Dr. Ray was talking to me earlier and welcoming me, and I haven't seen Steve Smith yet. I don't know if he's here yet. But over the, over the period of years that we've been doing the Hillsdale Dialogue, I've gotten to know a number of, of your colleagues and your faculty members via the radio. I'll see you on the radio. And I think it's been well-received, and I think they like coming on, but January. Again and again, it's always January. My intern last summer, Jack Butler, is somewhere here. Jack was a, uh, a terrific addition to the Hugh Hewitt Show staff this past summer. And he was on today doing an exit interview uh, in front of as many million people as were listening. And I asked Jack how he'd done. He's very fast. You have a very good cross-country and track program here. So I said, Jack, how did you do in the turkey trot in Cincinnati? 13,000 people competed in the turkey trot in Cincinnati. Jack finished fourth. I said, wow. I said, you know, if we adopt the Belichick rules, we can just get rid of those three next year and you'll win. And he said, that would not be the right thing to do. So you've taught virtue as well as uh, competitiveness. Uh, when I was last here at Hillsdale, I spoke about rectitude. And uh, I did so in the context of talking about George Washington, which is not a hard task. Uh, rectitudinous is a word that would go easily with George Washington. And so uh, I thought I would have a subject tonight that has absolutely no crossover with rectitude in George Washington, which is journalism. Uh, in fact, there's zero recycled material because there is, generally speaking, no crossover between rectitude and journalism. We are called ink-stained wretches for a reason. And ink-stained wretches do not summon up the image of being in any way virtuous. On the other hand, if you can find a journalist who is virtuous, you're going to find someone or some person or institution or organization that's going to deeply and profoundly impact the culture and for the good. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what that meant to begin with, what rectitude was. And some people think just integrity. So I actually went looking around, and I should turn to Paul or Larry or one of the philosophers to tell me what it meant, but I just went looking around in the way that lawyers do for definitions and various ways to approach it. What is rectitude if you're going to talk about rectitude in a journalist and why do we dominate talk radio? 
they are connected, these two subjects. And first, is it just virtuous? Uh, the state of being correct in judgment. I thought that was an interesting one, but I finally had to come up with my own definition, which is virtue supported by external bearing, meaning that not only do you have the internal core of virtue, but that you are externally understood to be by people as being virtuous. Now, how many of those do you think of when you think of journalism? Now, I understand that Carl Bernstein, for example, contributed a significant amount to the direction of the country, but I don't think of him as virtuous. Jack German, who wrote a wonderful book called The Fat Man in the Middle Row. Uh, Jack German, I used to watch every week on Washington Week in Review in the McLaughlin Group. I loved him, but I didn't think of him as being particularly rectitudinous. Recently, the editor-in-chief of the New York Times referred to a critic of his newspaper who had criticized him for not publishing the Muhammad cartoons in very direct and extended terms as an orifice. And he did it in an email and he made it public. Not rectitudinous, in my view. On the other hand, there are many who are. I think of Mark Stein as having incredible rectitude. Uh, and I, I know he's been a guest here on the, on the campus. He's got such courage. He has courage in abundance beyond any other journalist that I know. In any situation, he will just speak the truth plainly, and he's a man who's lived a virtuous life. I know some other ones, for example. Uh, William F. Buckley elevated every room that he ever went into, and I was only in a couple of them, but I am told, and John Miller would probably know this better than I, and there are some here who will know Buckley very well, that he was indeed who he th thought him to be and was a joy to be around. Joseph Epstein, uh, who has graced your campus a number of times, seems to me to be a particularly uh, great example of someone who possesses not only a great amount of talent, but a remarkable amount of rectitude. He has a new book out, A Literary Education, which shines a light on his young life, which allows you young people to understand that if you have not yet been rectitudinous, you can be in the future. <laughs> he lived one heck of a life in Chicago when he was young. But I, um, I nevertheless think of uh, journalism as not something in which people are going to find, but then you turn to politics and you ask, who's got rectitude in politics today? On Saturday in Iowa, there was a remarkable parade of would-be presidents uh, that included People who've been on campus, Ted Cruz. Uh, they had Marco Rubio. No, Marco Rubio is not there. I correct myself. They had Carly Fiorina. They had Scott Walker. Uh, Scott Walker strikes me as being an individual who's just overwhelmed, uh, over, overflowing with rectitude. He believes in what he says. He lives the life that he says he's going to lead. And he absolutely gives you confidence in his transparency and his authenticity. And that is part of that rectitude thing. So if you want to improve the public, you've got to elect people like that. In order to elect people like that, you've got to have a media that will celebrate those virtues. And if in fact you find those virtues to be corny, or you find those approaches to politics to be old fashioned or helplessly out of date, you're not going to have a media that is supporting virtue in the public square. Now I think that there's a model out there, and it's talk radio, that shows how to succeed in the new media world and that's why I wanted to talk a little bit about how conservatives came to dominate talk radio, because I think it's going to teach us how conservatives are going to come to dominate the new media as well. There's a lot of media everywhere at all times. Last night I drove over, I was in Washington, D.C. yesterday to uh, participate in Meet the Press, which is quite an honor. It's a high occasion. It's uh, the, the biggest brand in all of media. I had not been invited before. I was pleased to go. And I shared the stage with Tom Brokaw who wrote The Greatest Generation in Boomers and anchored the NBC Nightly News, and he's a fine guy. South Dakotan, plain spoken. I don't know his politics well enough to guess. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was in the house, so that was kind of interesting. Took all the pressure off because no one wanted to talk to you. They all wanted to talk to Kareem. Uh, and Chuck Todd, who's turned out to be quite a remarkably good moderator. He asks questions and he allows you to answer the questions, which is my model and has been the model of journalists I've admired across the political spectrum for a long period of time just to let the questions to be asked and to be answered. So I went from the height of that to driving across from Detroit last night, flew in before the storm got to the East Coast, and I was listening to various, I was listening to BBC World News Service last night, and a fascinating couple of reports, but then it, it got off on some tangent that I was not interested in, whales or something. And so I turned to ESPN radio, and I heard a, an interviewer talking to Jerry West. Now how many of you know who Jerry West is? Incredible basketball story. 
one of the greatest basketball players of all time. 14 years at the Lakers, then he became a coach of the Lakers, general manager of the Lakers, maybe one of the greatest basketball geniuses ever. And I was listening to the interviewer ask completely inane questions of Jerry West, thinking to myself, here is, here is a person that you could ask about, any, about shooting under pressure, about winning, working with Wilt Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor. You could ask him to compare the teams of them to the teams of now. Uh, the Cavaliers with LeBron and Kyrie and, and, and Kevin Love versus Baylor and Chamberlain and Jerry West. And instead, it was, it was Pablum. And I thought, that is such a perfect illustration for the audience. I stopped and pulled over and I said, make sure you tell them that every interview you hear is either well done or poorly done. And that person did not execute very well because that individual, and I, I know his partner a little bit who was not doing the interview, was not prepared to talk to, hadn't done any preparation, wasn't ready for the opportunity to take a mundane 15 minutes and turn it into something special. Not ready for the moment. So much of journalism is this way. There are so many eyes and ears available right now. Do you know that Facebook has 1.3 billion active participants? Twitter has 284 million accounts. Skype has 300 million. Snapchat, which is really relatively new, has 100 million. These are all platforms that did not exist a decade ago. So a decade from now, the number and opportunities for people to influence the culture and the politics of the culture will be so much greater than anything we've seen before. And they're all going to be possessed of the opportunity to either be good at it or to be like that interviewer last night and miss the opportunity to influence. So why did talk radio dominate? when it came along. First, the brief history of talk radio. It did not exist before 1989. Oh, there were local, absolutely local hosts, like Michael Jackson in Los Angeles, a man uh, with a great British accent, and a, used to be a liberal, but he came increasingly left as it went on. Michael Jackson in Los Angeles, and there were, Joe Pine was sort of a deeply conservative arch right-winger. Uh, Pete Franklin sort of invented sports talk out of Cleveland, moved to New York. There were a number of people who did it, but it was not national because of one federal government rule called the Fairness Doctrine. And the Fairness Doctrine mandated that if you took a position on an issue on the public airwaves that were regulated, you had to provide an opportunity to somebody else to make the opposite position. That is, if you think about it, incoherent. But of course, it was the federal government, so it makes perfect sense. You can't, there are too many opinions in the world to provide equal time, even on one subject, to all opinions. Cannot be done. But nevertheless, it was mandated. The consequence of mandating more speech was what? Less speech. Program directors and general managers across the United States did not want to put on conservative or liberal voices for fear that they would have to allow the opposite number of less talented ability onto that. And so there was no talk radio. The Fairness Doctrine was repealed by President Reagan, 1988. And in 1989, we had our first nationally syndicated conservative talk show host. The great news is that the proof of concept was in the form of Rush Limbaugh. He was the first, and he invented the medium. He built the mall, I like to tell people. We're all just branch offices of what he began. He was the anchor store on the AM dial. And he revitalized the medium by proving the proof of concept that people would listen to political talk radio. And quickly thereafter, there came a number of people who would take up in the list with him. There are today about 11 national hosts of significant size. But the first three mega hits, uh, the first three giant supernovas of talk radio were Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, and the third one was pretty late in the list. Mark Levin is a giant supernova. Mark's an old friend. We were together in the Department of Justice. And it is our great luck that the very first one, Rush, was funny, 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 smart and fast, because he proved the concept and others tried. The second one, Sean Hannity, is without question the nicest man in the broadcasting business. You cannot not like Sean Hannity if you've ever met him. In his radio demeanor, even though he can be a very tough interviewer, is that way as well. He's simply affability personified. And then the third great supernova, Mark Levin, is a constitutional scholar of the first rank. Now, those three have had monumental success in the business. There are a number of us who've had a nice level of success beneath them. Bill Bennett and Dennis Prager and Mike Gallagher and, and uh, Michael Medved. Laura Ingram is not in my network, but she's had terrific success. If you think of Dennis Miller, not in my network, he's had terrific success. 
Uh, Glenn Beck, not in my network. He's had terrific success. This is not network driven. These aren't people that are my partners. In fact, I compete head to head with Mark Levin, and I'm glad to because he's a friend and he enlivens the discussion. He raises the level of the conversation that is happening everywhere. But I want to ask you, of those people that I just named, what brings them in common? They really know about what they're speaking. And although no one is without flaws, and some of our number of our band have had collisions with this or that small controversy, they are generally completely authentically committed to that which they speak about. They are not trying to trick you. This is why we came to dominate talk radio so effectively and so quickly is that we were authentically who we said we were. I began in the business in 1989 as well in Los Angeles, California, on KFI on the weekends. And I went into television for 10 years, and I began doing my show presently in the year 2000, by which time Rush had cleared away all the boulders, and people were interested in syndicated talk from a perspective of people who actually might know what they were talking about. And if you look at the lineup I just gave you, Laura Ingram is a Supreme Court clerk and a fine litigator. Mark Levin is a constitutional law scholar. Glenn and Sean have sold millions and millions and millions of books. They're also very funny and very talented. Rush, of course, is Sue Jenner. Bill Bennett, PhD, JD, Secretary of Education. Michael Medved, JD from Yale, great film critic, accomplished scholar. Dennis Prager, uh, out there with uh, perhaps the greatest Talmud scholars at work in the public square ever. Uh, and he is, this is why we came. This is why we won. We didn't win because we were first, though it helped that the person who was first was Rush. We won because we were ready. We were prepared, and when the Fairness Doctrine went away, what had happened? There was a vacuum, not just for conservative opinion, but for prepared and talented professionals. So that when the opportunity arose to actually speak into the public square, Rush killed it. The two most successful communicators in American public media today are Oprah Winfrey and Rush Limbaugh who have had sustained audiences of greater than 20 million, of course, Oprah has retired now from television, for as long as they have been on the air. That's unrivaled, right? Just the numbers are unrivaled. Don't let anyone ever tell you other than the fact that the two most successful communicators in America are Oprah and Rush. Both of them work very, very hard at what they do. But we bring to it, different from the other media, complete transparency. And this is why the vacuum developed. Over a period of time, beginning in 1967-68, the media went left. Why did the media go left? I'm sure John Miller teaches this, and I'm sure that everyone in this audience that is at my age or older, 58 or older, knows this. If you grew up during that era, it went left because of Vietnam and the sexual revolution, and it went left very hard. And the media, which used to be a conservative organization, if you think back to the people who actually ran the newspaper chains and owned the, the networks, a very button down, live by the rules, support the order, fell apart as rapidly as the culture did. And the media went left in a hurry, largely because it was paying off to be left. And so overnight almost, as Harvard went left, the media which was fed by Harvard, and by that I mean all the elite institutions, followed it. So that over time, that which was supposed to be the genuine purveyors of real opinion and genuine journalism, which is Michael Kelly, the late Michael Kelly used to say, a craft, not a, a profession, a craft, began to tilt and began to tilt and began to tilt because we replicated each other. So if you were a New York Times editor, you would hire a crimson editor from Harvard. And if you came out of Harvard in the 1960s and the 1970s, you would be almost certainly left of center. I know of one conservative alum of the Harvard Crimson, Grover Norquist, the only one I know of. Uh, and Grover was a Harvard, I wouldn't have anything to do with the newspaper when I was there. Uh, because it was run by left-wing lunatics, and I was a conservative even then. So I wanted nothing to do with the papers, but the papers would replicate, and they would send in to the great media organizations of the day the next generation of media people. And so it went further and further to the left. So that before long, most of Americans did not begin to hear themselves in the media. They began to hear other than themselves in the media. They began to hear Walter Cronkite declaring that Vietnam was lost, they began to hear a constant fusillade against any Republican, but especially Richard Nixon, who was, of course, a polarizing force. They heard Ronald Reagan, who was one of the great men of the 20th century, uh, regularly derided as an idiot. Uh, they, I can go back, and people talk about how tough partisan politics are now. Believe me, as a veteran of the Reagan White House, it was just as tough in the 80s, if not more tough, and how they insulted the Gipper. But that was because there was uniformity in the newsroom up until 1989. 
there was no challenge to the orthodoxy. When that broke, Rush arrived, and suddenly, where did that audience come from? It came from everyone who understood intuitively that they were not being served truth, or at least a differing opinion. They did not, they are not easily fooled, the American people. It's very hard to fool them. Sometimes they want to be fooled. I think they wanted to be fooled in 2012. I think they wanted to be fooled in 2008, but I don't think they want to be fooled anymore. But in 1989, when Russia arrives and changes the paradigm, they knew what they were being given was not fair and was not balanced. What happened in 1996? I've just given you a clue. The Fox News Channel was launched in 1996. Rush had actually proven the concept that there was an audience for center-right or even purely conservative thinking, and that if you broadcast from that perspective, which inherently has within it fairness, and I challenge you ever to find a period of news as opposed to opinion programming on Fox that is not fair and balanced. They do represent both sides, regardless of what the left says. You will always find a position, perhaps of inferior numbers, but always represented well by a man or a woman of the left on the Fox News Channel. But the Fox News Channel launched in 1996, and into that, that wake that Rush had created, there was an audience ready to prosper it even as talk radio prospered and began to spread out across the United States, syndicated everywhere, so that Rush would have 600 channels. 600 channels in every city you could find Rush. What is Fox News now? Other than ESPN, the most demanded cable news network. Why is that? Because people like you who come not just to conferences like this, but can't afford to come here, can't get away from work, but drive back and forth to their house every day, want to hear what they understand to be authentically true because the people believed in what they were saying and they honestly weren't trying to trick you. They were being virtuous. Now, I have a list of some of the people who have recently practiced virtuous um, journalism. And I think you can all say about them the same things that I've been saying about some of these other people. George Will, Charles Krauthammer, Britt Hume, Fred Barnes, Bill Kristol, these are all good men, and I know men better than I know women, so I'm just going to speak about people I know personally and well. I've spent time with them, I know them well, they've been on the radio with me a lot. They are who they say they are, and they're not trying to trick you. They're trying to persuade you, but they're not trying to trick you. Charles Kronheimer's book, a nonfiction collection of essays, sold a million plus copies in 2014. Any of those of us, I'm hoping Dr. Arndt's new book in the fall sells a million plus copies, but I'm not going to hold my breath. It may take a couple of years. No one has ever seen anything like a series of books, a, a book of a series of essays previously published sell a million plus copies. Why is that? Because people trust Charles Krautheimer. Why do they trust him? Number one, he's really smart. Number two, he has suffered, obviously and evidently, there is nothing about self-pity about him. He is funny, and he's always prepared. Fred has told me that of all the people who's ever appeared, that he's appeared with, and Fred's done a lot of television and radio in his time, Charles works the hardest to be ready. So does, I would argue, Rush, so does Sean. People don't know the amount of preparation that goes into actually delivering something that someone will watch. It won't be that interview that I heard last night. And what I am hoping to persuade you about is that the next level of media, the next generation being trained here at Hillsdale, if they bring these same qualities to this vast array of instruments, will influence the culture purposefully and wonderfully well. Because it's never been this easy to get into media. It's never, I was asked at lunch today by Jennifer, and I don't know if Jennifer is here. I had a wonderful lunch with Jennifer and Janet today and a bunch of great students. And Jennifer said, how did you end up in media? And I can honestly say I've never asked for a job in media in my entire life. People have called me up, which does not happen. And there are eight crucial words which I told Matt at lunch, the most eight crucial words for a young person to know. Have you ever considered, and I know a guy. And so when I got a telephone call from my KFI program director in 1989, have you ever considered doing talk radio? I said, why not? It's got to be working. And I, absolutely it did be working. So I would start out in that radio. That doesn't happen anymore. That was the bad news. You had to be invited into the club up until fairly recently. Now you can force your way in by sheer talent and hard work and training. 
which is what I'm going to come to at the end here about what John Miller. We dominated talk radio because we were ready, we were prepared, we were who we said we are, and we performed well, and we worked very hard at it. Now, in front of us is this new media world, which includes, by the way, micro videos. You realize that most young people will watch something for less than 90 seconds before they make up their mind? But it's a very acquired skill before they will, they will turn it off. So you have to catch them. You have to grab their attention. The attention span of the average Hillsdale student, I'm quite certain, is much greater than the average attention span of the ordinary student. So you've got to be able to get the hook in. Then you've got to be able to entertain and inform and at the same time shape and form. So to John Miller and his young charges, I have sort of five challenges. First, you have to teach them to be good. First, you have to teach them to be good. Michael Kelly was, before Mark Stein came along, my Thursday first segment guest. In the radio business, Thursday is the most important day for a lot of reasons having to do with how you rate shows and gain revenue and add. Thursday is it, the first segment. That's why Mark Stein anchors that. He has for years. But before Mark started, Michael Kelly was there. Michael Kelly was killed in the March to Baghdad in 2003, December of 2003. For the three years prior to that, he had held down that slot that Mark now holds. And Michael Kelly was a good man. How many of you know his name? He was an extraordinarily gifted writer. And his parents were both journalists. And Michael would say again and again and again, journalism is a craft. It's not a profession. All you have to do is be good with words and with ideas, and no one can stop you from entering. He also wrote one of the greatest columns of all time, which I recommend you Google tonight. Christmas lights Michael Kelly, because all of the world is divided into those who like white lights and colored lights. Michael Kelly was a colored lights man, as am I, but some people are white lights men and women, and to them is their own domain. His wife was a white lights woman. So when a colored lights man marries a white lights woman, conflict ensues. And that's what this column is about. It's a beautiful piece of writing. It's a beautiful piece of writing. Go and read that. But he was a good guy. And he was very humble, very self-effacing. And why in the world was the editor of The Atlantic and a syndicated columnist and a Washington Post editor who didn't need to do anything, why was he in an R M M rap? In going into Baghdad where an RPG could knock him into the river where he drowned in the Euphrates. What was he doing there? He was a journalist. He was working. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to be where the story was so that it would enrich his experience of everyday life and he could bring it forward to people. That's why he was good. He was really good because he believed it. Number two, I think the best journalist and the reason that we have dominated talk radio is to an individual that I have just discussed. I've left some people out purposefully. But everyone I've talked about is gracious. That doesn't mean they are never angry. I've had a few memorable confrontations on the air myself. They're infrequent. Sometimes anger enters into it. Anger doesn't mean not virtuous. But I'm usually not angry. And I try very hard to be very gracious, even with my left-wing lunatic callers when they get through. And I make a habit of inviting lefties onto my show and hoping that they show up and that we have some great conversations. E.J. Dion. He's regularly on my show. Joanne Reed from MSNBC. Jonathan Alter from Bloomberg. I like liberals and men and women of the left to come on just to model how conversation can occur. And I find in the people that I have named, inevitably they are gracious, 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 even when they are confronted with overwhelming evidence of duplicity or ignorance. And that's when it's really hard to hang on to your belt and just say, don't lose it because this is simply so bad, but they are gracious. So be good, purposefully, intentionally good, and be gracious. Number three, be grateful and be able to name the people who gave you the opportunities in the business because it creates in you a desire to make sure that there are other opportunities along. I don't know how John gets all these Hillsdale students their gigs, except he must have been incredibly gracious and opening to other people, because all of these Hillsdale students are finding opportunities that just don't exist for a lot of journalism programs in America. And if you come to Hillsdale, I've just from what I've known for 10 years, you're going to end up with a shot. Doesn't mean you're going to win or succeed in journalism because of these other qualities I've talked about. But if you got onto the radio, you could win. You could dominate by truthful, factual reporting, and you worked pretty hard. But someone had to get you onto the radio. Someone had to give you an internship at the Free Beacon. Someone had to get you to the Wall Street Journal or to the Washington Examiner or into 
Salem Radio or any of these hosts, and that comes from having been grateful and being aware of, and people in my business almost always have an eye for talent. They know it makes you look good and better to bring up people who are younger than you, so they're almost always willing to work out and look very hard. Number four I've mentioned, I don't think that John has to be taught this or anyone else here. Teach them to work very hard. Uh, the long day of a journalist is what goes with the territory. And I guarantee you when Rush sits down, I guess at noon in the east, because it's nine in the west, he has already been at work for six or seven or eight hours. I know when my day starts, the hardest shift in the business is the morning drive shift, because you have to get up in the middle of the night to be ahead of the news. And you have to be news breaking, and you have to be ready, and you have to be current. That this work ethic is not easily maintained. I, uh, I've got this relationship now with Chuck Todd. He comes on the show almost every Friday, invited me back on his show. You know, I reached out to Chuck Todd because when he was a nobody in the business, he ran something called Hotline. How many of you know what Hotline is? Hotline was the only condition I had in my first radio contract. They had to buy a subscription, which was phenomenally expensive in the year 2000, $4,000 a year for Hotline. Chuck Todd edited it. It was a daily compilation of all the political news in the world, and it was no good to you if it didn't arrive on your desk by 8 a.m. 8 a.m. in the East, 5 a.m. in the West. I was doing morning drive at the time. I had to have Hotline. Couldn't read all those newspapers. I had to have someone else do that. So what time do you think they were getting up? It's incredible how much time. So he is a very hard worker, as is everyone who's really any good at this. And so I know that the Hillsdale, dialogue, that, that the Hillsdale curriculum requires people to work a great deal to be conversant in the subjects in which they're going to be quizzed by Dr. Ray or anyone else. That ethic wins. That wins every time. So when Larry Arn came on the show tonight and I was complaining about the drive here last night because the roads were kind of slippery and I've lost my edge as an Ohio lad, he said, you know, those of us who are about the business of saving the country don't whine much. <laughs> Appropriately rebuked, I shut up and got to the interview. But he was right. People who are about the business of saving the country in journalism or in talk radio don't whine much. They just do their jobs. And then finally, and this is the hardest thing, and I think the reason we succeeded the best in talk radio, why did we dominate from 1989 right to the present? It's because we actually believe that if we lose, the country loses. That the people in this business genuinely believe in American exceptionalism, and they understand that this country is the last best hope. My friend Dennis Prager, who's a wonderful, wonderful man, as much as fun as I make of Dennis, triple it, and that's my esteem for him. And I make a lot of fun of Dennis Prager. Um, his last book was called Still the Last Best Hope. 600 pages, dense. You can't make that up. You can't pretend to believe that. If Michael Medved writes a book, The 12 Lies About Capitalism, you can't make that up. You can't turn these things out. We write our own books. Nobody ghosts them in the side. You, know, you cannot fabricate or counterfeit the genuine need, if you're going to be successful in journalism of opinion variety, to be a patriot, not a parasite. And Rush is a patriot. You know, he's got his flaws. We all have our flaws. Sean has his flaws. I have my flaws. But every single person in talk radio that I have talked about tonight is a patriot. They want the country to succeed. They're generally alarmed by the direction that it's gone in, and they want to hold up and elevate that which works. Now, here's the good news in which I'll close on, and then we'll take some questions, is that by so doing this, you end up creating a dynamic that goes far beyond the media. You create citizen activists. I don't know where the country would be if the Fairness Doctrine had not been lifted in 1989. I don't. I don't know where people would have gone to prove the concept that Rush proved. No Rush, no Fox News. No Rush, no Fox News, no George W. Bush. Why? Because of Rathergate. Because in the wake of those two things came the blogs. So it was first it was Rush and talk radio, then it was the Fox News Channel, and then the conservative blogosphere came up. Prior to 1989, there was the National Review, there was the American Spectator, and a few very high-end publications that people could enjoy if they had money and leisure, but it was still by mail and the Pony Express. Afterwards, everything began to flood the zone. So we are winning because of that transition. 
And if we keep turning out craftsmen, like John and you are turning out here, we're going to win because we have the added benefit, to quote Kissinger, of it being true. We're on the right side. And that's why we dominated and we won because it was right. And that's why we're going to win the next generation. Thanks for having me tonight, by the way. Thank you very much, Mr. Hewitt. We have some microphones roving here. If you'd raise your hand and please stand when they come to you, and they will hold on to the mic, so try not to wrestle it from them. Uh, we've got a little while here, so please ask away, and uh, we'll ask. We'll go till about nine o'clock. That's right. Yeah. I'll go longer if you want, but it's cold out there. Go ahead. Thank you for speaking to us today, um, Ms. Atkinson, who was here yesterday told us that there's not a systemic media bias, that there are good reporters who want to get important stories out, but it's the editors and executives who self-select. Do you think that there is a systemic bias, or uh, w what's the case with the, uh, the media today? Excellent question, reflecting a good journalistic sensibility because you listened carefully to what she had to say yesterday. I disagree with her. There is a deeply systemic bias because of who selects to go into it unproperly formed. So that most, as, as I said, the career path for most of the elite media organizations begin in the Ivies and they self-perpetuate and they are not going through the Hillsdale rigor. You, can, you cannot take any classes at all, but if you're on the Crimson editorial staff, you'll find a job in big media. You'll be at CNN. I had a very telling experience with the senior political economy reporter for the Huffington Post. And it was painfully embarrassing to him. I'm not going to name him. Because it became evident to me in about five minutes for the senior political economy reporter of the Huffington Post that he had not a clue about the world he was covering, but he had a lot of opinions. He had not even heard of Desert Fox. Desert Fox was the operation against Saddam's weapons of mass destruction launched by Bill Clinton in 1998. Yet he presumed to critique George W. Bush on the basis of striking at non-existent WMD. So I asked him to square up with Desert Fox. How could Bill Clinton have been right but George W. Bush wrong? He was unaware of Desert Fox. He was the senior political economics correspondent for Huffington Post. How could he possibly write anything that made any sense at all? He'd come out of the University of Virginia. How had he gotten hired? Came out of the University of Virginia. He said the right things. He had the right attitudes. He told me he had marched in a couple of demonstrations against the war. If the intake valve is bad and it lets in everything and everything isn't required to learn anything, you have systemic bias. So I think, I don't know how Cheryl's path went, but I, I, find, I find it astonishing that people have not read, and I, I can't, I won't name people individually, the, the Looming Tower. The Looming Tower is the single most important book to have read about the war that we are currently engaged in by Lawrence Wright, who is a man of the left and the senior politics correspondent for The New Yorker. It is the history of Al Qaeda. It is the genealogy of Al Qaeda. From which did they come? How did they get here? Who thought up Osama bin Laden? Turns out it began in Greeley, Colorado, believe it or not, with a man named Saeed Khatoub, who was here in the post-World War II era and became radicalized and went back to Egypt and took the Muslim Brotherhood, which had already been founded, and made it very, very radical with a couple of books called Milestones and Under the Shade of the, the Banyan Tree. And so this is, what, this is what I think is sort of basic first principles that you've got to know to cover it. I can't tell you how many journalists have not read that. They're not obliged to. And so the systemic bias is really not about, I'm only going to hire uh, people who voted for Al Gore in 2000. It's not that crude. It's actually very sophisticated. It's a self-perpetuating credentialism that uh, to a certain extent, Hillsdale is defeating because it's created an alternative credential, one that is immediately recognizable in the world of serious people and conservatives. So that if you're working, if you're the editor at the Washington Free Beacon, Matt Continetti, and you want to know if someone's prepared to do good work and work hard and be correct in their facts, you see Hillsdale, you'll hire it. But until that comes along, they're taking us the systematic credential to Harvard Crimson or the University of Virginia Daily Paper or the Yale Daily News, and what it once stood for, it doesn't. So I, I think she's just wrong and we have to disagree. There's also story selection bias, which I think is what she was referring to. Dan Rather, who she probably worked with, once said, news is where you look. Very true. If you don't 
have a path forward. If you don't know what you want to find, you won't, you won't ever find it. In Rathergate, when the allegations were made against President Bush of non-service in the National Guard, that was a completely self-fulfilling prophecy that they wanted to be true to the exclusion of the evidence in front of them. It was false. That's how deep the systemic bias was. His producer at the time was young. He was old. So it wasn't an age deal. It was very much the blinders that they had put on. So I just have to disagree with her. We got one up here, too. Thank you so much for coming and speaking to us tonight. Um, so I know you mentioned Twitter and the conservative blogosphere. Uh, but besides talk radio, where do you see conservatives really making an impact in media? Uh, the, um, the Washington Free Beacon, the Washington Examiner are our go-to online sites now. Townhall.com, to which I'm a contributing editor, is a great aggregator, but original journalism is primarily coming out of those two and some of the old dogs like National Review. Uh, if you go to National Review, Eliana Johnson, who I was talking with John about today, is one ferociously talented reporter, she's 29. She's the, where is John? What's her title? What, what's Eliana's title? Washington editor of National Review. She's 29 years old. Uh, and that's because, and she was a Fox News producer under Sean Hannity. Then she went to National Review and began to write. A lot of the mostly young talent is just forcing their way onto the stage by virtue of productivity and story selection, and they dig, dig, dig. Eliana went to Nicaragua with Rand Paul for a week. Nobody my age will do that. You know, we just, we're not gonna go do a medical mission in Nicaragua to get a human interest profile of Rand Paul. You have to be young and crazy to do something like that. And so there are lots of young and crazy journalists out there. Then to put it forward, there are so many places beyond those three, but I'm just saying if you wanted the most credentialed thing, I, IR Review is a Facebook phenomenon. It's got the highest traffic of any conservative site out there. Not many people, how many of you read IR Review? It's not, it's not very well known, but it's driving the metric at the under 30 age. So we all get our media from different places, but I do not discount Twitter. I happen to believe that Twitter is the, is the shorthand for everything. And in fact, I was reading along in Dan Balls' wonderful book about the election 2012 called Collision 2012. And I was stunned, of course I did the Washington DC thing, Richard Vigory will know this, a book is always checked first for its index to make sure whether or not they've referenced you. And Collision 2012 hadn't referenced me, but I'm not upset by that thing, I know Dan Balls, so I started reading through. I didn't expect to find myself in the book, and I did. He quoted a tweet that I issued in the middle of the second debate, first debate, between Romney and Obama. Uh, and it summarized a lot of what was going on in the Twitter sphere. Do you know there's no need for a spin room anymore? The spin on a, on a debate is over before the debate is over. The die is cast by Twitter before it's done. You know who runs Twitter? Mostly the sub-30 demographic. They're snarky enough and they're funny. It's a delicate enough touch. It's so fast that if, if, if we unleash the trained and the talented and the truly good upon the Twitterverse, we'll win. So I, I think it's those big platforms to do longer form stories with the means of production evident in Twitter and IR and uh, a couple of other sites. Right here? Here's a microphone. Thank you very much. I guess I have basically two questions, or question and partial statement. Going back in history, it seems to me William F. Buckley deserves some recognition here relative to our conservative future, because without him, there would be no conservative future. The other part, and I guess that shows my age. No, nope, no, nope, that shows your wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> but the other side of that is the left seems to think the social media belongs to them. I am convinced that this is the genie in the bottle that will unleash the conservative revolution that is yet to come. Uh, you are, you're absolutely right about the latter. I want to pause though and give you a Buckley story. Everyone had a Buckley story, I have one. When I was young and really full of myself, age 17, I wrote a piece that I thought was really the cat's pajamas. And I said, that's a dating myself, right? So I sent it to William F. Buckley at the National Review with the suggestion that he publish it immediately. <laughs> what did Buckley send back? A beautifully gracious letter. Gosh, I'm chagrined even as I think, who knows what I wrote, it was, had to be awful. It was not in any way, because I was 17, what could I possibly have known? And, and he wrote down, um, unable to use Thank you so much for your contribution. I have a young friend who will be matriculating at Harvard this semester. Please look up Charles Kessler. 
who, from West Virginia. So the first person I met at Harvard in 1974 was Charles Kessler, brought together by William F. Buckley, answering the mail of young people who would write to him because of that. So that's who Buckley was. I mean, answering the mail of 17-year-olds in Warren, Ohio, really, the father of conservatism had nothing better to do with his time, but he was incredibly gracious and giving. Now, as to the explosion of, of truth, that's what powered every revolution that we've seen thus far. Now, revolutions are a dangerous thing, and I actually would yield to Dr. Ray and Dr. Arn about this, because it's scary how fast information moves. And you end up in a revolutionary moment with the capacity to change things quickly, as happened in Egypt, and they picked the wrong side originally, and Sisi has come back to rebalance it. But in Ukraine, twice now, they have stopped the Soviets from taking back the, the Russians, from taking back their empire, less successfully the second time than they did the first time. China knows it has a tiger, an absolute tiger on its hands. On the other side of my life, in the world of, of Christian witness, I know that it's become exponentially more effective to use new media than any missionary could ever have happened. You know, you've, you've, all of a sudden, you can reach across the world, and the Pope tweets for a reason. Right? Francis and Benedict before him tweets for a reason. It's because it's out there. So if what we believe is true, and truth is uh, affected, self-effectuating, then we should be winning. And there are some old barriers to blow over, uh, and I, I think we will win. I don't think people will put up with other than that, but there are also some very deeply vested interests that don't want to. So I hope I, I gave it. One other thing about Buckley, he invented good television before there was good television. The firing line is not known to anyone in this room that's under 45, right? I mean, I, maybe under 50. The firing line was beautiful to watch if you were young. It was just a beautiful thing to see, because he would, he had Malcolm Muggridge on often, and I would sit there, the words I didn't understand, the arguments I could barely glimpse, but Buckley's idiosyncratic delivery, the charisma of intelligence, he really, he really set the standard very high. Yes, sir. Uh, earlier in your lecture, you linked uh, George Will to rectitude. Uh, within the last year, he was on this campus, and in the Q&A after his speech, he advanced the idea that the country will never get better until the boomers are all dead. <laughs> Would you subscribe to that? George Will wrote a great column, it's indirect, wrote a great column about Bill Clinton at the end of the Clinton presidency, which I can quote from memory because it impacted me. So, and He may not be the worst president we have ever had, but he was certainly the worst person to be president. In that, he simply reflected the, the problems of his generation, the problem of entitlement and of overabundance and of a lack of suffering and a lack of, of scarcity and a desire on the part of that generation's parents not to put their kids through what he went through. So I think if he's referring generally to the idea of self-indulgence, I mean, we have borrowed $18 trillion and spent it. And it was uh, illustrated to me this past weekend by an individual who said, I went to lunch and I, I told eight people at a conference, eight young people, I'm going to lunch, would you like to go with my friends? And they all said yes. They said, well, you can't, but you're going to pay for our lunch. And that's what this generation has done, $18 trillion worth of debt. And uh, it's, a, it's a sad, unfortunate truth. So all dead, I don't know if necessarily dead, but out of the political circus, that would be a good thing. And I'm a young boomer. Not an old boomer, I'm a young boomer, born in 56, so I still count, and I think it goes up through 61. The only problem, here, here's the good news, and I was talking about this earlier with, with Larry Arn about, in reference to Tom Cotton, Mike Pompeo, there's a generation of warriors rising up, people who've been in this war, men and women, all under the age of 40. They are going to reconfigure American politics if we just hang on long enough. Uh, a lot of people have gone to the war, they're very serious, very effective, very disciplined, they're going to remake American politics, but we just have to hang on for 10 more years. Yes. Thank you so much. I am a big fan of the Hillsdale Dialogues. They're helping me write my thesis, so thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> now, that's more Larry and Paul than me, but good. <laughs> no, no, you're great. Um, I had a question because this evening I saw on the Drudge Report that Obama still has a 50% approval rating, and I'm mystified by this, how he can maintain 
that number. You had said earlier that Americans um, no longer want to be lied to. They no longer want to be deluded. Um, can you explain perhaps why he still has these numbers? Sure. At, at a crucial moment in time, he didn't. When it came time to actually vote, and I think psychologically it's a lot easier to say I like the president and I want him to succeed than it is to say I don't like the president and I don't want him to succeed. Uh, and, and that's just the American people are generous and large-hearted and they don't want the president to fail and he's such an epic failure. It's, very un, it's almost unpleasant to consider how bad a president he's been. From the perspective of anyone with children or grandchildren, you just know how badly awry the country has gone. Larry referred to it glancingly in his a couple of minutes of remarks there. It's, it's a very bad situation. But they don't want him to fail, and they don't want him to be as awful as he's been, so they'll say things like that. But when it came time to vote, it was a repudiation unlike any that we've had in a very long time. It was personal. But he has, as Dr. Arn said on the radio today, chosen to interpret it, his victory is irreversible. And as a result, he doesn't care. The State of the Union was completely contemptuous of the vote of the people. And to a certain extent, he, the immigration executive order rallied the left to him. So he's rallying the base, uh, and that will, be his, that will fade. This president is going to be so wildly unpopular by the end of these two years because it's all, you know, gasoline has fallen, and we're all grateful for that. That's a lot of it. We're not... We're, you know, Saudi Arabia is pumping as fast as they can in order to bring down the regime in Tehran, and we're all a little bit happier for that. So that's part of his thing. But it's not a genuine economic recovery, and we all know that. And so I'm not, I don't think that's stupid on our part. I think it's overly emotional on our part. Here we have one right here. Oh, okay. Oh, get the microphone, they want to record it. You mentioned a lot of people tonight that I certainly have a lot of respect for, like, like Rush Limbaugh and Charles Cardhammer. I'm curious, you never mentioned Bill O'Reilly. I was curious as to what you think about him. Oh, Bill is a, a wonderful entertainer. Uh, he's a, a very provocative interviewer. He invented his own format, which is, is, is as I said, it's entertaining. And he's, he's done a fine, pretty good job of turning out some books of, of general interest. Uh, but it's not my cup of tea because Bill interrupts like Chris Matthews, and so his counterpart is, is Chris, and I don't like it, and I can't do that. He's been a guest on my show many times, and if you're prepared to ask Bill questions and listen, it's a great interview. He's a terrific interview. Uh, in fact, he, he'll always say something newsworthy and noteworthy, but I, I don't hold him up as, as virtuous journalism because I, I don't really know what Bill believes as to politics. Do you? When he sat down with the president for the Super Bowl interview, you know, I, 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 in fact, Glozell, Glozell had a tougher question of the president than Bill did. When she asked him about the Cuba, how could you deal with those dictators? That was the toughest question. You know why Glozell got such bad press from the American uh, establishment media? Because she was tougher on the president than any of them in the White House press corps had been by asking him about the Cuba thing. So Bill's a wonderful entertainer. He's a tremendous success. He's one of a kind, but he's not what I'm talking about. And he didn't, didn't work in talk radio either, by the way. Didn't work. Well, I was just wondering about, you talked about how conservatives are dominating talk radio. I just wondered, could you give us some more about how, why they're dominating talk radio specifically rather than any other form? Yes. I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because it reminds me of something I didn't say. The left tried talk radio. It's tried talk radio many times. They had Air America. They've had a number of individual shows. My friend Bill Press had a weekend show same time I did. How many of you listen to Bill Press every day? So why does it fail? They have a built-in disadvantage called NPR. NPR is a subsidized left-wing outfit that has for years taken the cream of their uh, P1s, we call them in our business, meaning the listener who listens the most, and taught them to listen to NPR. You can't get a liberal away from NPR. It's like cocaine withdrawal for an addict to get a liberal away from NPR. So they can't, there's no market share for them to win. So that's one reason that, that we've won is that they, they don't, 
they can't compete on the field. And they won't acknowledge that NPR is liberal, so they can't, they, they shackle themselves, so they put their best talent to work in mainstream media and NPR, and they never quite come out with that. The second thing that I'll, I'll circle back to, I said it once, but perhaps too quickly, is it's long form. It's three hours. I love working in television. I love radio and television, but if you, if you force me to it, I'd stick with radio. For one thing, my career is longer because no one sees how old you are on the radio, uh, and you, you don't have to be 25 uh, to be on the radio. But secondly, you have enough time to do an interview of any length on any subject. If it's good, it will attract an audience. There is no more long-form journalism. 60 minutes passes for long-form journalism. And they'll interview you for an hour, and they'll cut it down to eight minutes, and that will be the end of it. And it's, it's ghastly. Most television is ghastly. And so yesterday, meet the press. I did the, I did the math today. Hour-long show, take out the advertising, four guests on the panel with Chuck Todd. I was on for five minutes. That's an eternity in television. That was, I got to make three or four points. I went in there wanting to make a point about Iran. Was Yemen was, I knew we were talking about Yemen. And I wanted to make the point that Yemen is not about Yemen, it's about Iran. All right, so it's about the Islamic empire extending itself through Beirut, through Damascus, uh, even through South America. I wanted to make a point that the Iowa Freedom Forum was mostly about Common Core. People think it was about immigration. No, the, and I checked this out with James Holman of Politico, fine young reporter, 28 years old, superstar rising, just works, 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 works. And I sent James a tweet. Public tweet, James, how many times has Common Core come up in the course of today? He tweeted me back. He'd been in the room for every minute of the, the session tweeting away, at least two dozen times. So I brought this up to, to Chuck on the panel and got the message out to the three million people that watch Meet the Press that Common Core is the issue that is driving domestic politics in the Republican primary. You know, this is news to the liberal elites, right? They can't possibly believe that's true. How could anyone be against improving education and parents are waving their hands and saying, stop, this is a nightmare, this is a beast, and it's, I can't do the homework, and my kids are upset. And then the third thing I wanted to make, it was a point some of you will like and some of you won't, is that I think Mitt Romney, well, I'd done some reporting, 80% certain he's going to run for president. I wanted to make the point that it's unique circumstance uh, in American politics. If you lose the election, you don't get invited back four years later. Uh, nobody was clamoring for John McCain to run in 2012 after he lost in 2008. No one was clamoring for, um, excuse me, uh, uh, who lost in our 2004 cycle? John Kerry to come back in 2008. No one, want, no Democrat wanted him to come back. Chuck pointed out that Al Gore had a little boomlet, a little boomlet, in uh, in 2004 after he had lost in 2000. No one wanted Bob Dole back in the list in 2000 after he lost in 1996. No one wanted George Herbert Walker Bush back in 1996 after he lost in 1992. Why is there this Romney thing? Because he has a hardcore base of support of between 30 and 40 percent in the party. Mike Huckabee got 40,000 votes in Iowa in 2008. Rick Santorum and Mitt Romney each got about 30,000 votes in 2012 in Iowa. He's got money. He's going to be in. Jeb is going to be in. We're going to have 15 people in the Republican primary. We're going to have a brokered convention. That this is, I just think the rules are going to work out, and that's a good thing. It's going to be a terrific thing. I want everybody in there making arguments. Dr. Arn and I were talking about this on the air today. That draws attention to our side and, and illuminates the political landscape with continuing conversation. Last night in Palm Springs, Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, and Marco Rubio sat down before the Koch summit. The Koch brothers promised to raise $900 million to spend on this election cycle. yoo -ha. I like that. Spend it on radio. Uh, but I'd want that. That's lightning in a bottle. Ted Cruz has been on this campus. I don't know if Marco Rubio and Rand Paul have been here, but I know uh, Ted Cruz has been here. I'd take that show on the road. That's better than Barnum and Bailey. I know because I do this all around the country. I just have to bring one or two interesting people together and folks show up because they're interested. Look at you. Why are you here? It's January. It's Michigan. Because <laughs> you're hungry for some substance that you don't get in the ordinary media. If you were getting this at home, you know, I, this is an aside, we're running late. There used to be something called Chautauqua. How many of you know what Chautauqua is? They are, they're still out there and they still operate, they operate on a different premise, 
when the Americans in the summertime would want to hear lectures about important topics delivered by people with expertise in their field. That's what this is. It's just Chautauqua, four times a year, with Matt and the Hillsdale staff making it possible for people to come here and, and have an extraordinary intellectual experience. That's what's missing in our media, and that's, I think, the 2016 election is going to bring us. One more? All right, Matt's cutting me off. Unless, you want, to, unless you want to take it. No, it's, it's a hook. They all want to go home. Go ahead. Um, I think one other aspect, Mr. Hewitt, or I should call you Hughes since we're contemporaries, um, is that with, with conservative talk radio, unlike other things, there's not the Gruber effect. What I mean is that we, you treat us as listeners with great reverence, with great affection, and you treat us as what we are intelligent human beings that can handle the truth and can can analyze issues from different perspectives or different aspects maybe we didn't think about before. So that, that respect for your audience and treating them that they are intelligent human beings is so attractive. And that's why we listen hour after hour. Thank you. You know, I wish I'd said that. Um, <laughs> it's going into my remarks. Um, it is absolutely true that I am not afraid to play the other side's speeches at length. I play the president's press conference. I'm not afraid that my audience is gonna be misled and I don't talk over people and I'll interview any liberal. There's a reason why Democrats won't come on my show if they're electeds. They won't get out of there. And it's not because I'm mean or abusive, it's that you just can't answer these questions. Chuck Schumer couldn't last 30 minutes with me uh, because if you start asking him about the sanctions bill in Iran, and about their habit of acting since the 1978 revolution, there is no way to defend a nuclear deal with Iran. It is impossible, and he knows that, so he will not go in harm's way. Which is why, by the way, as to systemic bias, back to the last, I'll, I'll finish by going to the first question. Why is it that if any Republican goes on, any Sunday show or mainstream media, they will be grilled, absolutely grilled, on the specifics of their policy? It will be relentless, it will not stop. Tim Russert asked, the late Tim Russert, who was very good at his job, asked Dick Cheney eight questions in a row about his heart condition. Eight about his heart condition. He wouldn't let it go. If the president goes in harm's way, he gets one question. It's like a tame set of reporters. They do not pursue, and he never puts himself in harm's way. And it's a shame that we've come to accept that, and the reason we do is because of the systemic bias and manners. It's okay to attack conservatism. It is simply not done to attack liberalism, not our class darling kind of snobbery. But I think that's being overturned by Twitter and as, as, as someone here said, we're winning because you, the truth is just relentless. It's 24-7 and if we're just gracious and we don't have to worry about anyone persuading our audience of anything. Our audience is smart. You know, and, and, and by the way, we have the statistics to prove it higher education, higher income, uh, more mobility. The reason we sell what we sell is because there, there are, I sell cruises that cost $10,000 of birth. Who's going to buy that, right? That's a very select audience. And uh, the, the fact of the matter is we're very comfortable with our people. We understand that they are not gonna be shined on. And if I ever try it, boy, the flag goes out, the penalty flag goes out in a hurry, they know it. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for supporting Hillsdale. Good night.